everybody. Welcome to this conference hosted by MS Focus, the Multiple Sclerosis Foundation. I'm your host, Deborah Foreman, the Educational Programs Coordinator for MS Focus, and I'm joined by Dr. Sabine Lulu, who will be talking to us today about family planning and multiple sclerosis. After a presentation from Dr. Lulu, we'll open it up to your questions and answers uh, and comments. Now I'm delighted to introduce our speaker. Sabine Lulu treats multiple sclerosis and related disorders, but will care for all neurological patients. Um, Dr. Lulu is the director of the Mercy MS Center in Carmichael, California. She aims to provide state-of-the-art care for all of her patients. She likes to listen to her patients' concerns and involve them in decision-making as she views the patient-physician relationship as a team. Uh, Dr. Lulu is the mother of two children, and she enjoys spending time with family, horseback riding, soccer, yoga, music, staying active. Dr. Lulu, I'm so happy that you're here with us today, and I'm going to turn this over to you. Thank you. Uh, all right. Thank you. Um, so thank you all for joining, uh, whether you're logging into the live uh, Zoom session or if you're watching this recorded session later on. Um, so hopefully this will be useful for you if you have MS or if you're someone treating someone with MS or if you're um, just learning about MS and trying to find out more information. Um, this is February 24th, 2021 and the date is really important here today because um, information changes. Um, two years ago, some of the information provided today would not be the same. Um, so um, I apologize if this is two years later and uh, the information is no longer uh, current. Um, so we'll just start off uh, by going over the outline of the things I'll be covering today. We'll just do a very brief um, introduction about what MS is um, for those who are new for, to MS. Uh, we'll talk about hormonal associations and MS, how genetics um, play a role in getting MS and developing MS and how that might come to play in your uh, family planning decisions. And then we'll move on to talk about pregnancy and lactation. And finally, the effects of other therapies that we use in MS and how that may affect pregnancy or conception, if at all. So what is multiple sclerosis? Um, multiple sclerosis is a chronic, inflammatory disease involving the central nervous system and that involves the brain and spinal cord. So that is uh, by effect of your immune system typically being hyperactivated, um, attacking um, your myelin, which is in your brain and spinal cord. Um, as a result, you have inflammation um, and the result of this inflammation is demyelination, which is damage of the myelin, and over time, neurodegeneration, which means it can cause damage to the nerves affected. So we'll talk a little bit about the immune system today. And just a very brief um, overview is the fact that our healthy immune system is constantly in an attempt for a balance. So um, your immune system is always working to fight anything that does not belong to you, um, to fight a virus, a bacteria, an infection, a foreign body. Um, and then there's what we call the regulatory immune system. And this is supposed to keep everything inside your body in check. Your cells are constantly multiplying and these regulatory immune cells are basically your fact checkers. So if there's any errors in cell multiplication, these cells play a role in basically getting rid of these abnormal cells and therefore um, you don't get cancer um, and certainly um, it can prevent you from um, having other illnesses that would otherwise be problematic. Now in people who have autoimmune disease, such as in MS, there is an imbalance in these regulatory and effector immune cells. Your regulatory cells, which normally 
are supposed to get rid of cells that are either damaged or cells that have inaccurate DNA or genetic material. Um, somehow recognizes the myelin in your uh, brain and spinal cord as foreign and therefore starts to attack that myelin and causes all the inflammation and demyelination and neurodegeneration over time. So let's talk a little bit about MS and who, why is MS important? Um, it is the most common cause of disability in young adults after trauma. Uh, in the United States alone, we have about a million people who are affected. Um, it tends to affect more women than men, and we'll get into a little bit more detail on the hormonal associations and why that is the case. Um, and it tends to affect those of Northern European descent, possibly due to the genetic background. Um, most people with MS typically have their first symptom between the age of 15 to 50 years of age. Uh, there is pediatric MS, so MS can affect children. And again, we'll, we'll go a little bit over that because we have some data uh, that looked at hormones in, in children um, who have MS. Um, and it is important to study MS because it is very costly, um, it, both the cost of uh, treating MS, the medications used for MS, and finally, the um, effect on the society, people with MS who either cannot work or are unable to provide to society because of their MS. And these are all um, losses um, that come to play. So why do people get MS? I get that question asked very frequently when I treat uh, patients with MS, especially someone who's newly diagnosed. Um, there are many factors really um, that come to play. And if you look at the diagram here, you see that there are many different things uh, that tend to be involved. Um, you need to have the right genetic background um, your immune system needs to be of a certain way, and you do have certain environmental exposures. And once you have that perfect storm of all three things together um, is what brings up autoimmune disease in general, but it's typically, and in this case, we're talking about MS, usually this is multifactorial. So let's talk about the genetic factors and MS. Um, the first recognized gene that was found to be one of the highest risk factors for MS is the HLA-DRB1-1501 gene. This was actually identified in 1972. Um, since then, we've been constantly looking for the genetic code that causes MS, and we certainly have not found it. But we found a lot of other risk alleles that seem to be more expressed in people with MS. Now, this particular gene is of interest because it is present in about half the people with MS, both with what we call progressive or relapsing remitting uh, multiple sclerosis. However, if you look at how many people actually have this gene, not everybody with the gene will go on to develop MS. And this also is a reminder of that diagram we looked at earlier, because you really have to have certain environmental exposures, certain immune system um, shape up, and the right genetic code. So one thing that we commonly um, get asked um, and people want to know is, you know, my mom has MS. What are my risks of getting MS? Um, so in general, when we talk about the general population, um, the risk of developing MS is about one in a thousand. So um, for every thousand people you meet, chances are you know one person with MS. Now this risk does change if you have a family member with MS. So if you have someone with MS in your family, whether it's a parent or a sibling, that risk increases from one in a thousand up to two to three percent. So two to three in 100. 
um, in some cases up to six in 100. The interesting data on genetics and risk of developing MS comes from identical twin studies. Um, typically, if a disease is genetically determined, um, if an identical twin gets that disease, the second twin is 100% at risk of getting that same disease. That is not true in MS because the data have shown in identical twins, if one of them has MS, the risk is about 25 to 30%. Again, it's not it's significantly higher than just a sibling or a parent, but it is not 100%. So again, this comes to emphasize the role of other factors in the risk of developing MS. So we currently have more than 200 risk genes identified. Some of those variants are on the X chromosome, which could be partially why women tend to have more MS. Um, interestingly, we found that those who developed MS were more likely to be smokers. Um, and the reason smoking might come to play is because of something called epigenetics. So what are epigenetics? Um, it's possibly the way that environmental factors can affect the risk of MS. So DNA modifications can happen without actually changing your DNA sequence. So your um, regulatory cells may not recognize that change, but it can affect how the gene works. So for example, it can turn a signal on or off depending on certain environmental exposures, certain diet. Uh, one most common uh, way that epigenetic changes can happen is by call by DNA methylation. And methylation is basically one carbon and three hydrogen atoms all together. And that can actually turn off that gene signal. Um, and it is thought that when you turn off that gene, whether it's maybe a, a cell that's supposed to not be activated in a certain way, whether it's a protein that should be protective, whether it's something that maybe then recognizes or causes your immune system to go on and attack your myelin, uh, these are all possible ways, and maybe that's how smoking um, maybe triggers your immune system in such a way or other environmental factors. Um, these genetic modifications can actually remain in the cells, and as the cells divide, may be passed on or inherited through generations. So, um, and this is important to keep in mind because, again, genetics alone do not determine whether or not you have MS, but environmental exposures uh, may be possibly act in this particular mechanism. So uh, as a joke, um, we kind of look and see um, how some people wonder uh, about aliens on Earth, and, and maybe some people apparently uh, saw, thought seriously enough of those to consider um, maybe, you know, we've inhabited Mars or, or maybe, you know, things are being hidden from us. Um, maybe that's how genetics work or epigenetics work that, you know, some people believe that aliens were originally the original habitats of Earth and, and then uh, we're, we're the second generation of humans with our new genetic codes. But all joking aside, um, epigenetics do play a big role in diseases because we know that some cancers and metabolic disorders and degenerative diseases can be related to epigenetic errors. We know there is an interaction between smoking and the HLA DRB1 gene allele, for example. Uh, we know there is a lot of associations with vitamin D deficiency and increasing your risk of having MS, possibly through epigenetics. Uh, we know certainly certain metabolites or cell-specific interactions that we may not know much about um, may also have a role to play in that. 
interestingly, uh, we are learning more and more about environmental or viral or infectious causes um, that can trigger your risk of MS. Um, it's not only that, but actually the order, whether you get EBV first versus HHV versus CMV, these are all typically childhood exposures. Um, sometimes the order of how you get, which infection you get first may shape your immune system in a certain way and may actually influence your risk of developing MS. So if you're thinking of starting a family, uh, whether you have MS or not, um, you're thinking about uh, possibly financial expenses, possibly your career, um, how that affects your career, um, what support you have, what assistance you'll need, um, your spouse or partner uh, relationship, and um, whether or not uh, you will be able to contribute to, to that family together. Um, and then you consider your family medical history. Um, you know, certainly there are some diseases where um, it could be recommended that you may not want to have children with, for example, what we call dominant diseases. Um, certainly MS is not one of those. Um, and then, of course, you think about the emotional history, the personal medical history. Um, now, in addition to all that, that every person possibly should think about before starting a family, people with MS have other factors to think about. So a few misconceptions that I frequently hear, whether from my patients or from discussions with other people, um, is that some women or families discourage women with MS from having kids, or even men who um, have uh, MS from having children. Um, some people thought that having children or getting pregnant can make your MS worse. Um, some people think that maybe it's not safe to get pregnant if you have MS or that MS does not allow you to be a good parent. Some people also think that maybe if you have very active disease that getting pregnant would make it better. Um, and even though that might sound a little odd, there are some slides that we'll go into later that might explain why people might think that. But in fact, all of these are false or misconceptions. They're false statements and they're not accurate. So let's talk a little bit about hormones um, and what we've learned about these sex hormones and the experimental models in MS. So the main sex hormones that we have are estrogens and testosterones. And estrogen can actually be uh, one of those very tricky hormones because in a normal range for most women in most of their younger adult life, estrogen is actually a pro-inflammatory hormone. It increases inflammation. Interestingly, the estrogen levels in pregnancy is protective. They're hypo-inflammatory. They do not increase inflammation. Um, either way, having estrogen actually decreases neurodegenerative changes. Testosterone, on the other hand, actually is very beneficial. It's, it does not promote inf inflammation and does not promote neurodegeneration. And this could partially be why men in general with MS tend to be diagnosed at an older age, um, especially that we know that testosterone does decrease um, as men get older. Now, keep in mind, even though it is well known that testosterone is the male hormone, women also have testosterone. So as women, we do carry testosterone, yet the levels are seven times less than that of a male. Uh, we also know that testosterone is uh, expressed in some of the androgen receptors um, as well um, or after conversion to estrogen. So what we've learned about MS in puberty um, by studying the pediatric MS population 
Um, when you look at children with MS, and again, MS in children is very rare. It accounts to about 5% of MS cases, so it's not very common. But this small number of uh, kids with MS, um, when you look at the younger kids, those who have not yet reached puberty, the rate of male and female children with MS is equal. So adults with MS, um, whenever you look at a population of people with MS, typically you'll see about 60, 75% of that population females and about 40, um, uh, 25 um, to 40% males. Um, this change we don't really see until after puberty. So pre-puberty, we see an equal male and female rate. And after puberty, we see that change, uh, that um, hormonal um, possibly as a cause, um, causing females to have a higher rate of MS than males. We also found that during puberty itself, both male and female children tended to have a higher relapse risk during puberty, during the time where they're going to puberty. And we also um, were able to identify that the, er the earlier age of puberty is considered a risk factor for MS. So what about fertility? Um, so, so far there is no evidence that supports that MS affects the fertility of males or females with MS. Now, I am aware of some studies that looked at cohorts um, and theoretically um, state that possibly men might have less um, motility or uh, oligospermia, I mean, decreased number of sperm in their semen. Um, but these have not been really reproducible studies so far. Um, there's also a lot of controversy on um, the fact the use of assistive reproduction in, um, in MS. Um, however, there is a recent study, even though it was very small, um, but it did suggest the use of fertility hormones. So women who are using fertility hormones who have MS may be at a higher risk of relapses and MRI activity from their MS. Um, even though um, this is something we have to keep in mind, it is important uh, just to highlight to recognize that potential increased risk to emphasize the importance of working uh, with your doctors in general to avoid um, the risk of relapse. So what about sex? I mean, women who um, and men who want to have children, I mean, that's that's the first step. So there are some issues in men and women with MS who it might affect their ability to conceive or their ability to have children. Um, for both men and women, there could be a decreased interest in sex, decreased ability to orgasm. For women, especially, the sensory stimulation might be affected. Um, physical limitations might be a problem in both men and women uh, if they have weakness in certain muscles um, or spasms might affect their ability um, to participate um, in sex. Uh, for men, erectile dysfunction can occur, especially if they have spinal cord problems. Um, these are generally usually treatable with medications. Um, but also some medications used whether to treat symptoms for, for uh, of MS. Um, sometimes some of the antidepressant medications that can be prescribed may affect um, both um, sexual libido or even um, for men, especially erectile dysfunction. For a lot of women, hormonal changes um, especially if women um, are older when they're interested in having children, uh, being perimenopausal, um, some of the other factors um, may also influence. Um, now, men do carry a little bit more of the weight um, with regards to um, uh, the sexual dysfunction um, and their ability to conceive if they have significant erectile dysfunction. 
uh, or if they have lower testosterone levels. Some people think that men may be at more risk for MS if they have lower testosterone levels. So theoretically, that may on its own cause erectile dysfunction, for example. But in general, typically the fertility has not been affected um, in general, especially uh, with the count and quality of the sperm um, so far. So when we think about um, planning a family, um, we think about these phases and typically there is a preconception phase, there's a pregnancy phase, there's the birth, and then the time after delivery. And then of course we think of the childhood. Um, so far, um, a few things to keep in mind, there's a lot of interesting studies that looked at vitamin D. Um, and the levels of vitamin D for women who are pregnant um, and the risk of MS in their children. And it is found that maybe women who are pregnant tend to have with lower vitamin D levels are more likely to have children who would go on and develop in general some immune diseases, including MS, for example. So how does pregnancy affect MS? So the pregnancy hormones, as we looked at earlier, estrogen in particular, favorably influence the immune response that underlies the MS pathology. So um, there's less inflammation, there's less neurodegeneration, um, usually with these uh, pregnancy hormones. Now we do know uh, there were actually before the late 1990s, it used to be the thing, the general thinking was that if you have MS, uh, you should not get pregnant uh, because pregnancy is bad for you. After the late 1990s, there was a clear cut studies that were published and recognized the favorable effect of pregnancy on MS. So if you look at this graph, you see that, um, and this is uh, divided by trimester, um, basically, um, you see that if someone, for example, has, um, let's say, 10 relapses uh, the year before pregnancy, um, that risk is generally cut in half, but keep in mind, 10 relapses cut in half is five, it's not zero. So there is still a risk, even though pregnancy in general is favorable, but if you are someone with very active disease, um, it is very important to get the disease under control prior to getting pregnant. If you're someone with relatively milder disease, especially in the year prior to um, pregnancy, um, if you've had one or two relapses, chances are you'll have no relapses during pregnancy. And the most protective time of pregnancy is in the last trimester. Now that is in contrast to after delivery, so postpartum, after delivery, uh, this risk increases up to a double to that from the pre-pregnancy phase. So these are all things to keep in mind because all that is something to remember uh, with regards to planning. So um, you want to maintain disease control before pregnancy and have a plan of action immediately after delivery. In general, pregnancy itself was not found um, uh, that it influences um, long-term disease or likelihood of developing worsening or progression in MS. So the pregnancy hormones themselves um, have been looked into for other immune diseases in general. Um, we know um, in MS, for example, the IL-17, uh, which is one of the um, uh, factors in your immune system that tends to be very activated in the setting of MS, is one of the things that tends to be blocked uh, during pregnancy. And if you think about pregnancy, it's, it's a fascinating and amazing thing that women go through uh, because women grow a foreign body, um, many cases completely different genetic material, 
sometimes a different blood type, and yet there is this complete distinction and differentiation um, from mixing with the two um, genetic codes. There's no mixing of blood. Um, and your immune system has something to do with it. Your immune system primes the pregnant body so that it does not fight um, the pregnancy. Um, there were some uh, diseases where the IL-17, um, when it is the main um, mechanism of the immune response, such as rheumatoid arthritis, MS, Graves' disease, or Hashimoto's thyroiditis, uh, that very commonly will improve during pregnancy. But there are other diseases, such as lupus, for example, that can get worse with pregnancy uh, because it does have different mechanisms. So what about the effect of immune disease on the developing baby? Um, there's a lot that we don't know. Uh, but it does not appear that there is a direct influence. Again, there could be other factors such as the vitamin D theory that or the studies that show the vitamin D um, tends to uh, in deficient pregnant mothers can increase the risk that this baby later on uh, is going to develop an autoimmune disease. So that possibly is it epigenetics? Is it um, something else? Um, so a few things to remember before pregnancy is it's very important to um, consider either couple counseling, um, look at your family factors, personal factors. Um, it is important to um, stop and think if you are someone with MS, has my disease been stable for the last six or 12 months? And if the answer is no, you definitely need to bring that up and make sure your disease is stable. Because even though um, pregnancy is favorable, remember post-delivery, that risk of relapse increases. Um, consider supplementing your vitamin D. Um, make sure you think about other medications that you take and are they safe for you to get pregnant on? And of course, you do want to discuss with all of your physicians, whether it's your primary care, your neurologist, your obstetrician, or other specialists, uh, what medications are safe to continue. So the other things to remember is a lot of people with MS, not only do they take therapies for MS, but they are on other medications that might help fatigue, um, that might help with their spasticity. Um, maybe there are certain things you can do or use. Um, if you're someone with maybe leg weakness and you do get pregnant, the extra weight um, on your body might make your leg even weaker, make it harder for you to walk. So make sure you think about these things and be proactive at looking at ways to help you function better. And most importantly, recruit help, whether family or friends, um, trying to get that help and assistance uh, planned ahead of time. It's always very helpful. So when we talk about MS disease activity, what does that mean? Um, so what does it mean for MS to be stable? Um, generally speaking, uh, there's many different factors that we look at. Um, most commonly, uh, things to think about are, have I had or did I have a clinical relapse um, on my current therapy or off therapy, because sometimes you have to go off therapy before you get pregnant, have I had a relapse in the last year? And again, if the answer is no, then that's a good sign. Um, the next question is, how do the MRI scans look? So if you're someone with MS, when was your last MRI scan? If you haven't had one in a while, probably a good time to get a brain scan. Uh, has there been a discussion with your doctor about the need to either start a new therapy or switch your treatment? Um, that probably indicates that your disease has not been stable. Or if your exam, um, that the last time you've seen your doctor, your exam has changed or worsened. Um, these are generally, um, and if the answer to all of these is no, then typically we would say your disease is probably stable. So it would be a good time to talk about and think about 
um, getting pregnant. So when we look at um, the uh, landscape of our MS therapies, um, and we start with the early 1990s when our very first MS therapy became available, um, up to our current um, treatments, which have been recently approved, um, we see there is many, many treatment options available um, with ver variable efficacy, variable um, safety profiles. Um, and if you're on one of those medications, you may or may not be able to get pregnant on them. You may have to stop or switch your therapy to something else. So keep in mind a lot of the data that we have on the disease modifying therapies and pregnancy come from animal models. Um, so these do not always translate to human pregnancies. The toxicities and risks are not always equivalent. Usually the studies tend to have reports of outcomes or pregnancy exposures, usually are very small studies, um, are very short. And a lot of times these are on women who were pregnant on a certain therapy and typically discontinued that treatment within a few weeks. So again, we don't have that long-term throughout pregnancy studies. Another thing to keep in mind is that a lot of the studies may not capture women who get miscarriages. Um, did the woman have a miscarriage because of um, environmental factors? Is it maybe a medication that she was on that could be teratogenic, which means it was toxic to the baby and caused severe um, fetal abnormalities, um, or is the miscarriage um, what we call natural? And sometimes miscarriages can happen in women with or without um, MS. Uh, furthermore, a lot of the data that we have tend to be very variable. Some of them are case reports, some of them are registries. Um, and the registries are a lot of them um, based on women who had or got pregnant on a certain therapy and they voluntarily joined that registry. Um, so unless every pregnant woman does contribute to that, we, are, we don't have um, very comprehensive data. Um, and then the question that we really don't know is, do the therapies that we use for treating MS, do those affect the ability to conceive? Uh, we don't think so. Usually we don't consider a lot of our therapies um, factors for women who have difficulties conceiving, but we don't really know. We don't have all the data that we can um, have to answer this particular question. So two, three, four years ago, um, the common practice was for a woman, if you have MS and you plan to get pregnant, you stop every treatment, including the disease modifying therapy that you're on, uh, at least three months prior to conceiving. Um, and we're saying conceiving, it's not even pregnancy. So if a woman doesn't even know if she's able to get pregnant, some women end up being off therapy sometimes for a year. And of course that comes with risks of a relapse or disease activity. Uh, more recently, we are learning that some of the injectable medications are considered safe to continue. Um, keep in mind some of these therapies do take time to um, to have an effect on uh, MS. So if you're planning, if you're someone who's newly diagnosed, for example, and you're planning to have a baby, let's say in the next three months, it's probably not a good time to start therapies um, like that because they take time to fully kick in. Um, in general, the discussion of whether or not it is safe for you to take a certain therapy or you should be on a therapy while pregnant has to always come, of course, with you and your doctor. Um, but 
we at least now know that uh, you may continue with some therapies with appropriate monitoring um, during your pregnancy. In general, all the pills, um, and I'm not referring to every other pill treatment-wise, I'm specifically referring to the pills that are the disease-modifying therapies in MS. Um, generally speaking, they all should be discontinued. Uh, but the question to ask, is it safe to stop? You have to discuss that with your doctor. Some of the therapies uh, that we use in MS, you would be at a risk for a relapse if you suddenly discontinue. So um, generally speaking, you do want to plan it um, and you want to plan it right so that you know when is the right time to stop these therapy. Um, in general, we do have some data on some of our therapies where women who either were participating in a clinical trial who accidentally got pregnant or in general from registries uh, from women with MS who get pregnant um, on one of the pills um, used to treat MS. And again, these are disease modifying therapies um, for MS. Discontinued for the rest of the pregnancy did were able to um, have healthy babies. So, um, so just because you were on a therapy and you got pregnant does not mean you should consider, for example, um, terminating the pregnancy, which I know thoughts some women have. Um, but um, just because you get pregnant on one of the therapies um, does not necessarily mean you have to terminate uh, the pregnancy. There are ways to monitor and measure and get some additional evaluations which can be recommended. Um, a lot of our newer or infusion therapies are considered um, relatively safe. Um, and I'm saying relatively safe because some of these therapies do have other risks you have to be monitored for. But because these drugs um, are generally monoclonal antibodies, they, they are very big molecules, they do not pass from the placenta into the baby uh, because it requires a lot of transportation and very advanced mechanisms that the placenta, the placenta is not developed enough to do. So, um, so in certain situations, especially those with active disease who need to be on a therapy, um, that can be arranged where you may continue or start certain infusion therapies. Now, even though we're talking about the drugs themselves not passing into the fetus um, in the first trimester specifically, but the effects of the drugs may be passed on. So for women who continue with some of the infusion or injection therapies throughout pregnancy, uh, for example, uh, with a Sabri, the baby's born can have some changes um, in their blood, like anemia, which tends to get better um, over time. Um, the other thing, some of the infusions that women can get once every six months, for example, um, could be planned uh, where you could get your infusion and use that six month period to um, make or have those pregnancy plans. And again, uh, a lot of the prescription, uh, the formal uh, prescription label for these drugs would say you're not supposed to get pregnant on these therapies for up to six months after. So again, this is something we keep in mind as a risk and benefit. So for women who are highly active, who want to get pregnant, um, these are discussions that can um, uh, be done with your doctors. So you should always weigh in the risk and the benefit um, of the therapy, the plan for pregnancy, the age. Of course, someone who's in their, who's very young might have more time to wait versus a woman who's diagnosed in her 30s or maybe early 40s and was planning to have children and then was diagnosed with MS um, and maybe might be more interested in considering an infusion therapy to both control the disease and potentially uh, have children. So what about relapses? So even though we talked about 
the fact that women in general during pregnancy tend to uh, have a 50% reduction in relapses. It's not 100%. So relapses can happen in pregnancy. Um, so for relapse treatments, um, in general, you do not want to take oral steroids. So no oral steroids during pregnancy for treating MS relapses, because these will pass to the baby. Um, there are certain situations when a pregnant woman is given steroids to mature the baby lung, and the reason they give them certain types of steroids is because um, it does pass to the baby, but this is a different indication and different dosing. Um, IV steroids are considered okay to use, typically in the second and third trimesters. Of course, there are some potential risks associated with those, but only 10% of the dose will go on and pass to the baby. Um, in the first trimester, they have been associated with a slight increased risk of some birth defect and increased risk of miscarriages. Um, plasma exchange is something that we typically only reserve for managing very severe relapses or for relapses in women who do not respond to steroids. Uh, but if a woman is pregnant and for some reason is unable to take IV steroids, um, then plasma exchange can be considered. And again, there is very limited data on the safety of plasma exchange in pregnancy, but plasma exchange is used in certain other conditions by some obstetricians to manage other things. And there is some uh, data in general, again, it's not MS specific data, but data that says plasma exchange may be used during pregnancy. Um, generally speaking, we avoid uh, getting MRI scans during pregnancy unless we need it. Um, most of the time, if it's a root for most people with MS, you're used to getting a brain scan about once a year or so. Um, but typically when a woman is pregnant, we don't necessarily get a brain MRI scan for routine or annual surveillance since it's not going to really change treatments. We're not gonna typically start a new medication um, or do any changes in treatment in a pregnant woman. However, if a woman is having a relapse and we want to decide, do we want to give um, this pregnant woman steroids, or do we need to put her or have her go through plasma exchange? An MRI can be done, it is considered safe, um, but we cannot use IV contrast, so no contrast in pregnancy. Um, we can evaluate for changes on brain scans by comparing to previous scans, and there are sometimes some features on brain scans that can help us identify if a lesion is new. It can be a little tricky, um, but it's best to compare to a prior scan and that can help address whether or not the symptoms are new symptoms um, or not. Um, other things to consider with relapses, um, just like for non-pregnant women for more severe relapses, uh, we can consider other assistance, such as physical therapy and um, other things to help um, improve function um, during a relapse. So what about someone who's newly diagnosed with MS? Um, we can certainly, again, use IV steroids um, in the right indications or plasma exchange. And again, we can consider starting disease-modifying therapies in select situations, uh, especially for those with very aggressive disease or very severe relapses. Um, again, it's all about a risk and the benefit, so we do have to um, establish uh, the indications of starting treatments. So what about delivery? Um, so there was studies looked at differences in pregnancy, birth weight, how long a woman is hospitalized, whether um, they, a woman needed vaginal delivery or C-section. 
But really the conclusion is there's really no significant differences um, between someone or women with MS and the general population or women without MS in general. Um, of course, there are some studies that have reported some subtle differences, um, but generally speaking, um, the indications for obtaining or, or for a woman requiring C-section versus vaginal delivery uh, should really be based on obstetric indications. So um, there are women, for example, who are unable to have a normal uh, vaginal delivery, could be because of very weak pelvic muscles, for example. Um, Usually an obstetrician is usually able to evaluate for the progression of the um, delivery um, and they are able to decide on whether or not um, that woman will need a C-section. So generally speaking, it would be an indication uh, for the obstetrician to decide on. Um, there were some studies that looked at rates of um, C-section versus vaginal delivery. And there were some reports that MS patients tended to have more C-sections, um, although it was thought to be a little bit of a biased situation where um, there were concerns that women with MS may not be able to go through with a vaginal delivery. But in general, um, most women with MS are able to have normal vaginal deliveries. So after delivery, uh, breastfeeding. Um, we always like to have discussions about breastfeeding. Breastfeeding is protective and very much encouraged for women with MS. And the data on breastfeeding is so great that um, we actually um, see that rates of protection is very similar to the last trimester. So 50% reduction in MS relapses. Keep in mind, this has to be exclusive breastfeeding. So women who partially breastfeed and partially bottle feed um, will not have the same benefit. And if you can see here from the graph, what we look at here on the left is the probability of being relapse free. And this is the time to the first relapse. And the top graph here is for women who exclusively breastfed. Um, so the, the risk of a relapse is the lowest for women who exclusively breastfeed. Uh, women who do not breastfeed at all will typically have this classic drop in their hormones. Um, and we see that three times increased relapse risk in that postpartum immediately after delivery period. Um, it is generally recommended um, if we need to use high dose IV steroids uh, for treatment of any relapse, um, especially um, you know, that we talked about the slight increased risk of relapses. It is recommended that a woman would express and dump breast milk um, for about 24 to 48 hours after the last dose. So the IV steroids are typically given between three to five days. So, um, so that's about possibly a week of expressing and dumping breast milk. Um, because there is a risk that this will pass on uh, to uh, the baby through breast milk. So what about medications and disease modifying therapies? These are the drugs we use that are immune therapies um, that help decrease relapses in MS. Um, again, it used to be uh, thought that if you are breastfeeding, you cannot be on any therapy. Uh, we now know that the injectable or traditional therapies um, are actually considered safe. And the new recommendation is if you're one of those, or if you are on one of those traditional therapies, you can continue your therapy and safely breastfeed your baby to minimize the risk of relapse. Um, 
monoclonal antibodies, of which uh, these are mostly the IV infusion therapies, and one of them is an injectable, are generally large enough molecules, and they do not pass in breast milk. And therefore, the studies have been reassuring that these are safe to start or continue while breastfeeding. Oral therapies, pills that are used as disease-modifying therapies in MS are not recommended. They can be expressed in breast milk despite limited data, but we do know that they are generally expressed in breast milk. We don't know how safe that is for the baby. Maybe they're okay, we just don't have the data. So at this time, we do not recommend starting um, any pills um, during the breastfeeding period. So going back to the pre-pregnancy counseling, um, so you want to consider discontinuing medications. Um, those could include disease-modifying therapies if they're a type of therapy that is not safe to continue. Um, and symptom treatments, which are the medications used um, to treat symptoms. Uh, think about the risk and the benefit of these medications. Um, if you're someone with MS with very highly active disease, keep in mind if you stop your treatment, you are at a very high risk for relapses and therefore, the disease should be stabilized and ideally relapse-free for a year before getting pregnant. Um, a reminder that about 50% of pregnancies are not planned. So it's not uncommon that you may not have planned your pregnancy. Um, so it's always a good idea to always talk about pregnancy planning even if you don't plan it in the next year or two, but always talk about what is um, for, for physicians um, or healthcare providers who are um, attending this, think about asking that question. What are your pregnancy plans? Um, anytime you're thinking of starting a treatment or switching therapy. This is also important because it also reminds uh, people to take reliable contraception if you're not planning on having children uh, to prevent these unplanned pregnancies as in certain situations. Um, you do need to do significant changes in treatment. Um, again, if you have MS, regardless of what therapy you're on and you do get pregnant, um, there is no recommendation to terminate pregnancy based on all the information that we have, even with some of the therapies that are considered um, not safe. Um, there are certain things that you could discuss with your obstetrician, um, certain ultrasound or certain surveillance things that can be done to evaluate if the fetus is at risk or was inadequately exposed or um, if there are significant birth defects that are caused. And again, if you are someone with MS and you do get pregnant, um, it's very, very helpful if you participate in a registry to provide your experience to help um, other people. So in summary, you want to maintain disease activity, uh, you want to optimize your therapy, think about lifestyle changes, avoiding any toxins, smoking, uh, recreational drug use, making sure your vitamin D levels are where they need to be, taking your prenatal vitamins, and then recognizing the issues that can happen during pregnancy. Um, sometimes if you're off certain therapies, um, some symptoms might get worse. Um, if you are to have a relapse, uh, have a plan with your doctor, what is the plan for managing a relapse if it happens? Think about breastfeeding and how protective it is. Of course, we didn't talk about all the benefits of breastfeeding to the baby, but think about how breastfeeding is helpful to you as well as your baby. 
Um, and then recognizing postpartum care um, and your MS and whether or not it's the right time to start um, your treatment for your MS or continue um, what you're taking or change your treatment. Um, so if your pregnancy was not planned, make sure you let your doctor and neurologist and MS, uh, MS uh, the doctor and your obstetrician know as soon as you find out so you can develop a treatment plan. Um, other things to keep in mind when you're thinking about a family, we are an aging population. So we, many of us care for um, either an elder family member or might be taking on the role um, of that, whether it's a sibling or a parent or another family member. Um, so if you have MS and you're um, considering becoming a caregiver, make sure you think about um, a few things such as, are you able to take on that role? Uh, think about what the situation needs. Think about strategies of who you are to ask help from. Um, think about your social network and, and problem solving and strategies because that can affect um, stress and emotions. And finally, recognize your own physical and cognitive abilities to becoming the caregiver um, before you take on that responsibility. Um, and uh, thank you. I'll be happy to take uh, questions if there are any. Wow, thank you so much. That was so informative. I was, I'm taking notes and notes and notes. And notes. <laughs> that was awesome. Um, I don't see any, any questions in the chat. Let's see if there's anybody um, raising their hand. So if you have a question or you'd like to make a comment, you can raise the, raise your hand in that app or you can, um, or you in the chat app, or you can just raise your hand, click on the screen to pull up the menu, select more, which is that little icon with the three dots and then raise your hand. Then I'll unmute you and you'll, when I say, would you like to be unmuted? You have to say yes. So let's see. I have a question while we're waiting. Sure. So when you get pregnant and you have MS, do you immediately get sent to the maternal fetal medicine specialist or do, can you work directly with your general OBGYN? Um, so um, I, I think that's a great question. I know um, a lot of uh, women with MS prefer to see a high risk uh, maternal fetal medicine obstetrician. In many cases, it's not necessary. So if it's someone who's younger, who's otherwise healthy, uh, maybe even off their therapy, it's probably okay to go ahead and see a general um, obstetrician. For people who are on high risk medications, some of the infusion therapies, or we consider them high risk for relapses who have to continue treatment, I would generally favor they go to a high um, risk obstetrician. Um, but I mean, I think we can work together. It's not always the case. We've, we've had it go both ways. Okay, good. We have some questions. Uh, let's see here. We have uh, Kate has said she's been taking Jelenia for 10 years and just learned about the high risk of disability if you discontinue this treatment. Can you direct me to any studies or other data about women who have taken a break from Jelenia to have children? So um, there are again, some prelim data from registries. Um, it is generally not recommended you continue with Jelenia, but you're absolutely right. Um, Jelenia is associated with about a 50% risk of a relapse when you discontinue the medication. And that's why it has a black box warning with that. Um, so if you are planning a pregnancy, um, you might want to discontinue and you might have a strategy plan with your neurologist to either bridge with something else that would be safer, that is rapidly, that works very quickly um, to avoid that relapse risk. Um, again, it's not 100%, not everybody relapses, but those relapses can be severe. So 
Um, so there aren't, again, the, the, the studies on pregnancy in general and very specific drugs are very, very limited. Um, but certainly you can um, seek out the help sometimes from the drug companies themselves. They may be able to share whatever data they have from their own registries. Thank you. Um, Corinne just said thank you and she wants you to know it was an excellent presentation. And Kim has a topic, I'm going to question rather. Uh, she says, I'm not sure you will have a thought on this, but I get asked this a lot. How does a person with balance or mobility issues learn to safely parent, such as carrying the baby if you have poor balance or, um, or keeping a toddler from running off if you're in a wheelchair? So certainly these are real, real struggles for sure. Um, I mean, I suggest you work, this is why I mentioned physical therapy in the pre-pregnancy planning phase. Um, talking to a physical therapist about your own physical needs um, is very helpful. Uh, there are actually some situations when adding weight, so for a pregnant mother, sometimes having the extra weight helps with balance and stability in some cases. Uh, most pregnant women always complain that they're wobbly, but that's because of the stance that women tend to need uh, when they're pregnant. Um, but in general, talking to a therapist about what are certain tools to uh, utilize to help, maybe you don't typically need to use an assistive device, but might be a good idea to use one to prevent falls. Um, Maybe it might not be recommended to, for example, carry the baby and walk if you're unable to physically do so. Um, if you're using a wheelchair and you're worried about the toddler running around, you can always recruit family help or maybe, you know, um, make sure that you're, you know, they have these devices that ties a toddler to you where they can't run away for too far. You know, I always found those funny, but they're very handy and useful, especially in big crowds, which I know we're, we're not seeing at all these days. Uh, but, uh, but having little tools like that can certainly allow you to have um, almost near normal um, functioning abilities, but there is modifications and, and things that you have to do differently because you have MS for sure, yes. Okay, those were all great questions. Um, I don't think we have any more, and I really appreciate your willingness to go above the hour mark. That was very nice. Um, fabulous stuff. So that's all the time we have for now. If you've missed any part of this conference, it'll be replayed on msfocusradio.org and available on demand on our MS Focus SoundCloud page or our YouTube page. Remember to follow MS Focus on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram for times and access information. Our next teleconference is tomorrow. Um, that's uh, Thursday at 1.30 uh, p.m. Eastern time, and we're going to be featuring Dr. Annette Okai. In honor of Black History Month, Dr. Okai is going to be talking about addressing bias in healthcare. Um, our sincere thanks to all of our attendees for your participation, and especially to Dr. Lulu. Thank you so much for the time you spent to prepare and to share this information with us. Goodbye, everyone, and have a great day.